discuss how bones are formed. Chapter seven should help you also study for the lab practical because it goes through the different parts of the bone. Why is it that I made you memorize the mastoid process? Why is it that I made you memorize a styloid process? There are reasons why we need to uh, you know, know those parts. Why? There's an ugly picture. So obviously your bone is not supposed to go in that direction, right? I used to play a lot of basketball when I was younger and a lot of football when I was younger. And I remember as a football coach watching this actual play happen, right? And this guy right here was supposed to be a first round draft pick as a wide receiver. And in one play, he had a compound fracture <clears throat> of both his tibia and his fibula. He never stepped foot on the football field again, right? So it's crazy, but you know, life changes that quickly. And for him, he, I mean, I always tell any of the students, right? It's like when you have a chance, especially athletes, when I coach, when you have a chance, I mean, you know, go pro as soon as possible, right? You never know when you have a, have a devastating injury like that. All right, let's talk about functions of the skeletal system. So these are all very general function. Obviously we know it's very good for support. Bone is hard, rigid. And notice that we start putting cartilage with it, right? We're gonna see cartilage and bone are very intricately linked. So much so that as we grow and gain in height, the only way we grow in height is by increasing the amount of cartilage growth we have. You guys have heard of your growth plates that are found at the ends of all of our long bones. Well, the growth plate is made out of cartilage. So if you're missing that cartilage in the growth plate, you can't grow. If you have a lot of cartilage, then you can grow taller and taller. This is one way doctors have to kind of give you a better indication of how tall your kids will be. Usually they don't do that, right? Unless your child's gonna be super tall or really short, almost like achondroplasia, like a little person. So there's a big association between cartilage and bone. Ligaments connect bone to bone, whereas cartilage, right? Whereas tendons connect muscle to bone, right? And usually with cartilage, you're gonna see that at the end of long bones, we will have a lot of cartilage. So if you've ever eaten a chicken thigh or a drumstick. Now, obviously when you're eating a drumstick, like a chicken drumstick, a turkey drumstick, what bone is it? That's the tibia, right? I know, right? Would you buy like a turkey drumstick at State Fair if it says turkey tibia? Probably not, right? Probably sounds gross. But that's what the actual bone is, is the tibia. Now, when you're eating a drumstick and you look really carefully, there's that small little bone right next to it. That's your fibula. The fibula is going to be very thin. For us, the fibula is also really thin, but not as thin as for the chicken. So yeah, when we're looking at different meats, we do share a lot of the same anatomy and physiology with some of the animals that we eat or we surround ourselves with like dogs and cats, right? So one of the functions support, then it's gonna protect, obviously the skull is gonna protect the brain, ribs and sternum and the vertebrae protect the lungs as well as the heart. Obviously another big one right here that we know, movement produced by muscles and bones via tendons. Now this one, storage is also very important, right? Storage of calcium phosphate. We're gonna see in the second semester, calcium is a big player when we talk about forming blood clots. And it's so important that when we remove calcium from your blood, your blood doesn't clot at all. So what we're gonna do is we need that calcium in our bloodstream. So when there's excess amounts of calcium from our diet, we're gonna store that calcium as calcium phosphate, as hydroxyapatite, making the bones more dense. At the same time, that calcium phosphate can be remodeled when you don't get enough calcium in your diet. 
So there's always that kind of back and forth, homeostasis between having too much calcium in your diet, you store, you make stronger bones. And then there are times when you don't feel like drinking milk. Well, you start breaking down more bone so then you can release the calcium into the bloodstream. So eventually we want to have more, right? More production of bone than recycling and remodeling. Now, the last one we usually think about with bone marrow, right? Blood cell production. Red bone marrow gives rise to all blood cells, red and white, as well as platelets. The red bone marrow is a location of the stem cells that differentiates into RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. RBCs, red blood cells, white blood cells. Next, we're going to talk about eh, what did I do? this, right? Components of the skeletal system. So obviously skeletal system, bone, we kind of know, right? Obviously it's a skeletal system. So bone, it's gonna be inherently part of the skeletal system. But these other types, we don't think about. Hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, elastic cartilage, right? Can also be components of the skeletal system. Now, when you're eating a drumstick, if you look at the very end of the drumstick, it's very shiny. If you look at the other end of the drumstick, it's very shiny. Why is it? Well, because the ends of all of our long bones contain hyaline cartilage. At the ends is where you'll usually have a joint. Another bone makes contact with it to form a joint, right? So what happens with that movement? We do not want bone to bone rubbing. So we have hyaline cartilage covering the ends of the bones. So then we can have nice smoothed out movements that prevents wear and tear on the bone. We'll all see fibro and elastic. So let's talk about that cartilage. Cartilage are formed by chondrocytes and chondroblasts. What's the difference? Chondroblasts are the immature form. That's the blast cells that really build, right? The cartilage matrix. Once the chondroblasts so I want you to think about these cells are immature. There's lots of open space. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna start putting cartilage matrix, expelling it outside of its plasma membrane. Once it expels it outside of the plasma membrane, you form that matrix. And now you're surrounded by that matrix. When you're surrounded by the matrix, you become a chondrocyte. So the only difference between these two is the surrounding matrix material. If it's cartilage matrix, then the chondrocytes, right, are resting on that matrix. It produced the matrix. Now it's completely encased in the matrix. The base matrix is made out of collagen for strength, lots of proteoglycans for resiliency. Think about your nose and your ear, right? Like we kind of easier to remind ourselves right, when we're kind of watching and reading. Matrix sounds really tough to understand. Well, the matrix is what gives us the crispness when we bend our ear in half. The perichondrium, and to be honest, they talk about the perichondrium a lot in the textbook. In reality, it's very sparse, the perichondrium. Perichondrium are usually found in kids that have yet to grow to their full adult height. You don't see the perichondrium in mature cartilage, right? Now, what is a perichondrium? Double layered of connective tissue sheathing. Covers cartilage, except at some of the most important places, at the articulation points, found at the end of the long bones. So at the point where you have, or might have bone on bone contact, the ends of the bones, well, what happens is we don't have a perichondrium. Why is a perichondrium so important? Perichondrium has an inner and an outer layer. So here's the perichondrium right here, right? So there's an immature cartilage area. Perichondrium on the outside, perichondrium on the inside. The perichondrium on the inside contains stem cells that turns into chondroblasts. Why is that important? It's important because it allows cartilage to regrow to heal and repair itself. 
if it's damaged, right? Now, that's really good. The problem is we don't see it in usually the areas where we need it most, in the areas where we have bone movement, right? That's one of the reasons why we don't have the ability to repair cartilage is because you don't have the perichondrium in those regions. The outer regions of the perichondrium has blood vessels and have lots of nerve innervation. Now, again, most regions of our joints do not have perichondrium. So when you damage the joint and you damage the meniscus, or you hear people having bone on bone contact, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you have bone on bone contact, that you have completely worn away the cartilage found at that joint. A joint is a meeting place between two bones where there's movement, right? Where there might be movement. Some joints, there's no movement, right? But that meeting point between the two bones, gonna have hopefully lots and lots of cartilage to smooth out the movement. But with time, it wears out. And then, right, because that area doesn't have a perichondrium, you can't have healing, you can't have regeneration. Now besides, right, so this perichondrium is found in some areas, but definitely not in the area of the articular cartilage, right? That has no peri perichondrium, therefore little or no regrowth after damage. This is where it gets kind of tricky. Cartilage growth and bone growth, right? Cartilage growth, when we say there's cartilage growth, there's appositional and interstitial. Appositional growth of cartilage is growth in length at the periphery. That's a big part right here. Right, so when we are in utero, we're going to have growth of the cartilage in length. Now, you might have heard that when we're in utero, that all of our bones, even the long bones, all of it is made out of cartilage. That's true. The long bones are almost all made out of cartilage at first. And then we slowly replace it with bone tissue, right? But when it's cartilage, it still can grow. And when it grows in length, we call it appositional growth. We'll also see appositional growth when some kids start hitting puberty and they grow real tall. Again, you're gonna have this appositional growth that allows you to grow the cartilage in length. And then we're gonna replace that cartilage with bone. So then the more the cartilage grows in length, the more possibility of growth of bone in length. So appositional growth in cartilage is growth in length. Interstitial growth in cartilage is growth in width, making it stronger, making it thicker. Now, why do I say it's tricky? Is because when we talk about bone growth, right? Not cartilage growth, but bone growth, the terms are switched. So just be careful when you're taking the quiz you're reading it carefully. I never try to trick you with tricky wording, but this is tricky. I don't know why they wrote it in like this, right? When they were going and naming things, but this is something that is just inherently tricky, right? Appositional growth in cartilage, growth in length. When we talk about appositional growth in bone, it's the opposite, is growth in width. So there is that trickiness. Interstitial growth in cartilage, growth in width, Interstitial growth in bone is growth in length. So there's that small little variation then, right? Now, bone histology, matrix. The matrix is like reinforced concrete. Rebar is collagen, cement is a hydroxy appetite. Do you guys know what reinforced concrete is? Yeah, me neither until I you know, looked it up. Reinforced concrete is this. Most of you guys have probably seen like a remodeling of a building. For me, I was there when they started, you know, uh, when they started building the Pfizer Forum and everything surrounding it. With the Pfizer Forum, it has to be super strong. So the best type of concrete is something we call reinforced concrete, right? And we see it all the time in buildings. It's basically what they do is they use, they pour concrete and there's some metal rods and metal right? Tubes right there. Some of the metal rods and tubes might be actually pretty thin. That's rebar, 
right? Rebar is the metal that they put in reinforced concrete. Now, reinforcing it, you imagine, why would you want to put metal in there? Well, what it allows a building to do is slightly flex. So it's very windy, right? There's a little bit of give in the rebar. So then the cement can give without rupturing and breaking apart. Without rebar, cement is heavy, is very dense and strong, but it can crack just with a little bit of movement. That makes it, all right, not very safe. So the rebar allows for a little bit of flexion in that building without rupturing the building, rupturing the cement. Now, the cement part, right, is a hydroxyapatite. So collagen is a rebar. Cement is hydroxyapatite, right? Hydroxyapatite is calcium phosphate, just a fancy name. Now, what happens and how does this act like reinforced concrete? Simple. When we jump, when we run, all right, even when you sit down real quickly and all your body weight goes to your hip, what happens is when you put that kind of stress on your all right, femur, your femur actually bends a little bit. So they did a video where they took an x-ray of a basketball player. This was a while ago. So, all right, you guys probably never heard of him. His name is Jordan Farmer, all right? He used to play for UCLA. So what happens is he, you know, jumped and then dumped, right? Just something simple, right, for a basketball player. But what they did was did an x-ray and what they saw was that as he bore down, so then he can jump, right? Well, the femur actually flexed a little bit. As it flexed, when he jumped, it kind of recoiled up and pushed him up higher, right? So what allowed him to flex and then recoil? That's a collagen found in the bone tissue. What makes that possible is the presence of collagen, right? Now, the hydroxyapatite gives it that tough density that we think of when we see bone or when we are eating a chicken bone and you really see it then, right? If the mineral is removed, the bone is too bendable and that's what we see in osteoporosis. If collagen is removed, then bone is too brittle, what we see in osteogenesis imperfecta. Anybody watch the movie Glass or the newer one where they had, you know, the M. Night Shyamalan with all three guys, right? Well, in Glass, the Samuel L. Jackson character had osteogenesis imperfecta. The problem is the collagen is mutated. And because a collagen is mutated, it can't flex. So anytime, right, we don't think about it because we do it so often and it doesn't break. Anytime he would fall, anytime he'd fall and brace himself, anytime he would run and hit something, right? Well, if you hit your arm on something as you are running, that's pretty violent. And if you can't flex your humerus, what happens? Instead of flexing, it just breaks, right? And people with osteogenesis imperfecta break their bones so much that usually by the time they're in the early, you know, probably short of five, six, seven years of age, they're usually gonna be in wheelchairs, right? They're usually pretty short and have multiple, multiple fractures that severely limit their range of movement. And every time they have a fracture, it hurts just the same as if we would have a fracture. And they have it many times in a given year, right? So usually the lifespan of people with osteogenesis imperfecta isn't really great. And even now it's hard to treat. All right, how do we form bone? First, we have osteoblasts. So this is a good picture of it. So the osteoblasts, so this is the cells that make the bone. Now there's nothing in the middle, nothing yet. No bone material between the cells. What we're gonna see is that these cells are connected to each other by cell processes. These cell processes contains gap junctions. So then as one cell that's closer to the central canal, it's going to receive the nutrients first. It's gonna pass it on to the next cell, which passes on to the next cell, which passes it on to the next cell. 
right? Eventually you have so many cells in between that the nutrients are gone because each cell needs its own allotment of nutrients. It can only pass so much more on to the next cell. So these cell processes with their gap junctions allow nutrient exchange from cell to cell. What else, right? These cell processes then, right, are going to be very important for not just communication, but for bone, right, formation. And what we're going to do is when these osteoblasts receives the message to remake bone, is going to form more collagen, release it by exocytosis, and then add hydroxyapatite to it. Eventually what happens then is that the spaces between the cells become encased in dense bone tissue. As it becomes encased in bone tissue right here, what happens? Well, what happens is, right, we never cut the cell processes. Bone builds around the cell process. So then we always have the connection from cell to cell to cell. Right? So then we have a tunnel that's formed as we're building around these cell processes. Right? That tunnel is going to be incredibly important because it's going to be little canals that connects one cell to the next. That never gets removed. Right? The osteoblast makes all of the bone tissue, turns into mature osteocytes, completely surrounded by the matrix it forms. Now, the canaliculi contain the cell process. Remember how I just mentioned that you build around the cell process in a 360 degrees. You build that bone tissue around it. So then there's a canal that forms where the cell process is residing. That's the connection from bone cell to bone cell. Nutrients diffuse through the cell process found in the canaliculi. So then you can have one cell very far away from the blood vessel, but it's still receiving, nu uh, still receiving nutrients because of the interconnectedness of these cell processes. Now, osteoblast turns into osteocytes. They both come from stem cells called osteochondral progenitor cells. So you have these osteochondral progenitor cells that can turn into chondroblasts or osteoblasts. As they turn into chondroblasts or osteoblasts, they're gonna make bone or cartilage. Then they're gonna turn into osteocytes. Now, I also mentioned that we remodel bone a lot in regions that have a lot of stress right? Like your knee, your femur has a lot of stress because it's bearing your body weight a lot. Well, we can have a lot of remodeling in that region of the distal femur and the proximal tibia. Well, remodeling means you have to break things apart and then rebuild it. Well, we already know that the osteoblasts are going to rebuild it. Osteoclasts, though, are going to remodel and destroy. They resorb bone releasing calcium and phosphate. Now, unlike the osteoblasts, these osteoclasts are not formed from, from stem cells in the bone marrow. Instead, osteoclasts actually are derived from white blood cells called monocytes. And these are modified immune cells that fuse together to form osteoclasts. They come from a different population of cell line completely. Now, if you take a look at this, this is the multinucleated fused osteoclast. And their main purpose is to dissolve bone, freeing up the calcium phosphate, which get released into the bloodstream. As you destroy that bone tissue, now osteoblasts can move in. Once these guys are gone, they can move in and fill in that gap, strengthening that bone again. Perfect. That's exactly what we want. Right. I'll stop after going through this. Woven bone versus lamellar bone. What's the difference? Now, if you take a look, there's two main type of bones. There's compact bone that I mentioned, 
right? That compact dense bone, that's a bone that we idealize when we think of bone as being real tough, right? Real dense. That's compact bone. With compact bone, you have a one central blood vessel, we call the central canal, and then you have multiple layers, right? Cells, osteocytes being layered around that central canal and building bone around that central canal. Now that's one, right, system or one osteon. For a dense bone like the femur, the shaft has to be incredibly strong. So you don't just have one osteon here and that's it. You're gonna have another osteon here and then another osteon here, another osteon way over here and another one way over here, meaning you have multiple osteons, all super strong individually. But now you have another one, another one, another one, all surrounding these osteon right in the middle right here. Now you have additive strength. Right? You don't just have one osteon, you have hundreds of them next to each other, each very strong. Right Now you have hundreds of them, you have this incredibly additive strength from all these different osteons. That's what makes compact bone so tough and so dense. Now, the bad news about compact bone is that because there's so many osteons, it's really heavy. So we don't have just one place in our body where all we have are dense compact bone. It would make our, our bones way too heavy to move. So what we do is have a combination of dense compact bone and the second type of bone, spongy bone. Spongy bone right here is different, right? Take a look, there's a lot more space in between, right? Before, this is dense compact bone. Look at how thick that is. There's no space right here. Yes, there's a space in the middle right here, but that's area absent of bone tissue. It will be filled with fat, right? Here with spongy bone, right? You see lots of open spaces. The open spaces here are where we see our red bone marrow. You guys have heard of a bone marrow transplant. Well, there's a reason why people don't volunteer right, easily for bone marrow transplant donors. The reason is in order to actually see if you're a match, you actually have to drill through some bone and get into the spongy bone area where you'll have the bone marrow. In other words, you have to use a needle, break through your hip bone, and then aspirate out some red bone marrow. It hurts, right? It's not like just you know do a tissue type. You actually have to break part of the bone and go through it, right? And it hurts. Now the spongy bone and most all the bones in our body are combinations of spongy and compact bone. Compact bone usually covers the external aspect, making it very strong, dense, and tough. To lighten it up a little bit. Right, you can imagine, this is what we see in our bones of the skull, right? You see a sandwich, compact bone externally, making it tough and protective. Compact bone on the inside, smoothing out the bone, but a large layer of spongy bone in between. So it's a sandwich of compact on each side, spongy in the middle. Now, what does it do? it lightens our skull. So then our skull doesn't weigh so much, right? This spongy bone is still very strong, just not as strong as the dense compact. Now what makes it, you know, what makes it important is the spaces in between allows us to have red bone marrow, right? Stem cells that can turn to RBCs, WBCs, platelets. Right. Now, the trabecula are plates of bone tissue, right? Plates of bone tissue that kind of moves out in a very ordered way, right? Usually the plates of bone tissue are all towards, and it allows us to resist stress. So this is, see the stress lines right here is the weight of our body. 
So as you are going in a few seconds, you're gonna go from a sitting position to stand. When you stand, all of your body weight was gonna be, when you're sitting, was in the hip region, right? So all of your body weight of your torso and the abdomen and your neck and the head and the arms, all that body weight when you're sitting is going to be diffused around your hips. When you stand up, you need to take that body weight and take that body weight and move it to the strongest parts of our femur. The strongest parts of the femur are our compact bone area found in the shaft. So these trabecula allows us to take our body weight and transfer our body weight to the dense compact bone region. They're always oriented along the stress line. Now, the trabecula is basically what looks like one osteon. That's it. So each trabecula is one osteon. Strong individually, but you don't have a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth other osteons next to it that we see in dense compact bone. Instead, you just have one layer, right? And we call that because it doesn't have central canal, we call it a trabecula. Right, last thing, come back here, right? Woven bone and lamellar bone. Woven bone right here is our first step in bone formation, right? When we are first forming bone during fetal development, when we are repairing our bones from a fracture. What we need to do is somehow, especially if you have a fracture, all right, we need to make sure it doesn't get worse. So what the body does is it tries to align the two parts of the bones that have been displaced and broken apart from each other, right? What it does do is it kind of forms a intermediate bone, this woven bone that tries to connect those two pieces of bone that are fractured apart. This woven bone have, remember, it's just a stop gap, right? What happens is it has collagen fibers that struts out, reconnecting the ends that are broken. It's not a very strong woven bone, but what it does do, it links those two regions together. Now, if you know you have this break and then you have a, a, a cast placed on there, the cast makes sure that the bones are close together. So then the woven bone is then sealing the two ends, but it's not a very strong seal yet. So that woven bone is an initial bone formation, sealing it, helping it repair itself. But because the collagen fibers are just randomly assorted, it's not very strong in any one direction. That's not good. So what do we need to do? We need to remodel it. Depending on where we are, right? We're gonna remodel it. If you have a fracture in the shaft of the femur where there's dense compact bone, well then the remodeling is gonna take that woven bone and turn it into compact bone. If the fracture is at the end, right? Either the head, the neck, or the proximal end of the bone. Well, that area of the bones are gonna have more spongy bone. Then what we're gonna see is, right, we have that initial woven bone trying to reattach the two regions. Then we're gonna remodel it. And that area that after remodeling, you're gonna have trabecular spongy bone that's gonna replace that woven bone. Eventually, all of the bones will be repaired and it should be the same kind of bone that it started with. So if we started at the ends and we had a lot of spongy bone and there's a fracture at the neck, that does happen, especially in elderly people, when they fracture their hip, do they actually fracture the hip bone? No, they're actually fracturing, right? Usually the neck of the femur, right? And when it fractures, you can see how much smaller the neck is, right? It's very small compared to the head, compared to this area, it's huge over here, right? So the area that can break and most likely will break in a fall is that neck. So what happens? The body will try to seal that gap between the bone by initially putting this randomly assorted 
collagen and forming woven bone. Then with time, right, we're going to replace that woven bone with trabecular or spongy bone. Perfect. Just like Neil. All right. I'll stop right here.